Okay, can I um, call this meeting to order and welcome you all to this the sixth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in this session. And can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Um, the first item on the agenda is to invite us to consider whether we take care agenda item five, discussion on work, pri work programme in private. Do members agree to consider this item in private? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. We can then move on to agenda item number two, which is consideration of continuing petitions. The first petition we'll consider today is petition 1595 by Alexander Taylor. The petition calls for a moratorium on shared space schemes. We'll be taking evidence on the petition from Hamza Youssef, the Minister for Transport in the Isles. The Minister is accompanied today by two officials, Jill Mulholland of Transport Scotland and Sandy Robinson of the Scottish Government. Can I welcome you to our meeting? Uh, Minister, before we turn to questions, can I ask if you have any opening comments that you would like to make? Thank you, uh, Convener. The Scottish Government is committed through Scotland's Road Safety Framework 2020 to achieving safer road travel in Scotland and protecting vulnerable road users such as uh, children, pedestrians, uh, pedal cyclists, uh, people with disabilities, of course, including those with visual impairments. Uh, the framework includes a commitment which states that the Scottish Government would publish national guidance on designing streets, focusing on the needs of pedestrians of all abilities. The National Guidance uh, Designing Streets was published in 2010 and provides Scottish local authorities with key considerations and guidance for the design and redesign of new and existing streets. It sets out, uh, uh, sets out a street user hierarchy, which considers pedestrians first uh, and the private vehicle last. It clearly states that the design of all streets and spaces should be inclusive providing for all people, regardless of age or indeed ability. Uh, designing streets acknowledges the importance and complex role that streets play in supporting communities and in meeting ambitions in a number of policy areas, from supporting active travel options and improving public health, right the way through to reducing emissions, to increasing footfall and social interaction, and importantly, reducing the speed and dominance of vehicles and creating spaces, spaces which all people can access and enjoy. In order to do this, designing streets promotes a, a collaborative approach, uh, which is based on balanced decisions and the importance of local context and indeed local views. Designing streets includes information on shared space. It sets out some of the design principles behind that concept. It does not actively promote or recommend shared space, but instead, instead highlights the potential benefits of creating streets that reduce the vehicle dominance, encourages social interaction, and creates a positive sense of place. An important element, element of the guidance within designing streets is the emphasis on the need to ensure that design is inclusive and the need to consider the needs of those with a disability in particular, again, people with a visual impairment. The guidance acknowledges that shared spaces, if not designed and developed in careful conjunction with road users, it can pose problems for some people with, uh, for some people who are partially sighted uh, or indeed uh, blind, and emphasises the importance in recognising that those uh, with a disability may require additional supportive measures. Uh, the detailed design of particular schemes developed by a local authority must recognise and respond to the needs of all users. Uh, design should be collaborative with representatives from local disability groups and access panels uh, invited to provide input from the early stages right the way through the development stages. Designing streets sets out the national policy perspective and key design considerations. Uh, however, the implementation and interpretation is, of course, a local matter and needs to respond to the specific circumstances and indeed the local context. Uh, Scotland's first accessible travel framework, which I launched in September, contains a vision where all people with disabilities can travel with the same freedom, choice and dignity and opportunity uh, as other citizens. To achieve that vision, we are committed to listening to and involving people with a disability in making travel more accessible. Uh, disabled people told us that this is not just about transport, but also making sure they can get to their transport. Having accessible paths and road, buses stop, bus stops and stations it must be a part of that. Uh, in conclusion, convener, uh, that, is, that is why I'm keen that roads uh, authorities, Transport Scotland uh, for the trunk roads, of course, local authorities for the local roads collaborate 
and have ongoing engagement with local residents, including those with a disability and the representatives, to design a better streetscape uh, for all. Happy, of course, to take questions. Thank you very much for that. Can I maybe um, begin by asking, first of all, on this question of you, you've established a national policy. You say it's a matter for local authorities to implement it, which I understand the physical implementation of shared spaces makes sense. Why would it be a local interpretation of those policies if there were simple issues of rights of disabled people that apply right across the whole of the country? Mm. There is also a, a, a bit of guidance which I think is very, very helpful uh, and useful uh, as well, which goes alongside designing streets and the guidance associated with designing streets. Uh, that is produced by, by, by Scots uh, and you know, the chief officers to do, uh, Scotland's uh, chief officers of transport, uh, who have produced from a local level guidance that they think should apply to all 32 local authorities. And that's the National Roads Development Guidance. And inclusivity of shared spaces is very much a part uh, of that. Um, so there are examples of where shared spaces and local authorities have worked well, that uh, inclusivity of people with a disability and visual impairments have been a part of that from early inception stage right the way through to development. And there's clearly areas where it could be done uh, better, but uh, we've done this in collaboration with local authorities, Scots primarily, uh, and those officers in, in transportation pr um, producing guidance uh, as well. That's not to say... I'm close-minded to seeing how that guidance can be uh, improved. Uh, and that's why we're here and have an interest in Mr Taylor's petition. Okay. I, mean, I suppose the point I'm trying to establish is do you recognise that the national context of the rights of disabled people wherever they live to ensure that planning meets their needs? And therefore, while there may be room for local expression of what shared space looks like, there must be pretty fundamental basic things about the rights of disabled people that would apply generally, and would you therefore, if you're able to identify schemes that seem to be in contradiction to that, do you see a role for the Scottish Government in addressing that problem? Well, I mean, I think we're always happy to see if our guidance can be improved uh, to, to, to that extent. So, I mean, taking this issue, we recognise that level surfaces, for example, can you know, cause difficulties for those uh, with, a, with a visual uh, impairment, but there are things that can be done uh, in order to address that, and I can come on to that uh, later on. Um, so if there is a local policy that uh, is not meeting the national standards, and let's remember that local authorities, of course, have public sector duties. Uh, they have to adhere to the Equalities Act 2010. The arbitrators of that being the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, ultimately the courts. Uh, there is redress if those national guidelines, both from a Scottish perspective, but also UK national guidelines, uh, are not being adhered to. Uh, if the guidance, and the suggestion is that the guidance needs improved and, and, and further flesh needs to be put uh, on that guidance, I'm happy to explore it. But uh, you know, there shouldn't be That's local schemes that go in contradiction of national policy. If they do, and as I say, there are some very fundamental duties that they have to uh, adhere to. And if that's not being done, then there are, uh, of course, enforcement uh, measures. It seems quite a significant escalation that somebody would have to go to the courts to enforce their rights when I suppose what I'm trying to establish is the extent to which the Scottish Government, in its planning guidance, is able to identify their basic issues around disability. So can I give you just maybe a simple example and, and, and get your response? Designing Street says there's a preference for controlled crossings for older and visually impaired pedestrians. And the word preference, I think we would agree, would seem to suggest a stronger liking for one option, but other options um, would be acceptable. I think that characterisation differs from the strength of opinion, certainly, that we've received and come across in the submissions about this petition. So would you consider changing the language in designing streets to reflect that strength of opinion that we have heard? It's not a question of you know, the slight preference for one view other than the other, but there's a very strong preference um, for controlled crossings. Uh, if the committee uh, would like me to do that, of course, uh, I think it's a, an eminently sensible suggestion to do so. Uh, the reason why the word preference is because there can be, be other options, uh, tactile paving. Uh, there can be, for example, uh, very small delineations in the road of you know, 25 millimetres, for example, that wouldn't constitute a kerb, but would be uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, marked enough in terms of a delineation so that somebody using a stick uh, might well be, be that might be helpful uh, to them um, but absolutely more than happy to look at the guidance having looked at Mr Taylor's um, petition and uh, seen some of I think the very genuine concerns 
uh, that he has raised and having the chance to even speak to him very briefly before coming in here, uh, one of the suggestions uh, I explored with my officials was can we work with uh, our partners when it comes to the guidance, uh, work with our partners at Edinburgh Napier uh, University, they have a transport institute um, and maybe we can have a seminar uh, to explore the exact um, concerns that the petitioner uh, has raised in his petition and see again how we can strengthen those guidance notes that exist. There's our own guidance, there's the Scots guidance and, and members may be aware that there's some UK government work being done on this in the back of uh, Lord, Lord Home of Richmond's report um, as well. So if you can take all of those uh, and, and, and you know any suggestions be, be on, on changing some of the wording as, as you've suggested, convener, or perhaps more detailed um, discussions on, on the petitioner's concerns, I might be more than happy to, to explore that. Okay, thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, can I just first of all just declare an interest uh, in this as I um, am backing the campaign in, in this constituency um, with regard to this uh, scheme. Um, Transport Minister, part of the, the whole concept of shared space seems to be the anticipated behavioural change on the part of the drivers. Uh, pedestrians and other users of the space um, and a number of the submissions talk about the role of eye contact in, in that sense and, and what that means to be able to safely use the non-controlled crossing. Um, however, the point has been made that, that you know, many people are simply not in a position to make this type of change, for instance the visually impaired uh, people or people with cognitive issues, learning dif disabilities um, or other conditions. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that you use the word inclusivity a lot in your, your opening speech and um, you've now been talking about guidance. Um, the, the particular scheme um, I am talking about here is about to go live, if you like, in about two or three weeks' time with four-way non-controlled crossing, which, frankly, is, is terrifying that my constituents, that the very thought of going to it, particularly if they're, if they're, if they're less able. Can you just clarify... Um, what, I, know, I know that, uh, for instance, in this instance, with this local authority, uh, visually impaired groups and others were not consulted. And I know that you say that that's part of, of the whole, the, the, the whole uh, premise of it. Can you just clarify what can happen if that hasn't been done and it's going to be going ahead regardless? Uh, is that not a, a, a con contra contravention of, of uh, the people's rights if they weren't consulted and are not being listened to? Yes, and I'm uh, reluctant, as the member would understand, to get right into the nitty-gritty of the, every local uh, decision on every local high street. I mean, uh, I can't, as a government minister, uh, mandate what happens in every local high street, but I uh, absolutely understand her concerns um, about the scheme that she's, uh, represent, uh, she, she, she's mentioned as a local representative. Um, if that was the case, as she surmised it, then it would be deeply worrying because all of the guidance, be it uh, our own guidance, be it Scots guidance, which was just from a local authority perspective, uh, or indeed even DFT guidance, although not necessarily applicable, but still uh, the outputs are uh, very, very useful and helpful indeed, all talk about collaboration with local access panels, local disability groups, and so on and so forth. And um, I should say designing streets is predominantly aimed towards residential and what we call lightly trafficked streets. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not to say it's not applicable to town centres. I'm just saying it's, 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 it's aimed towards those lightly trafficked and, and residential areas. And therefore, if the um, guidance uh, of, design, of designing streets and the guidance associated with it were being implemented onto um, areas, town centres that are vehicle dominated, vehicle heavy, then clearly consideration has to be taken to those with uh, disability and visual impairments. If that hasn't been done, if it's causing danger to them, then we would certainly urge the local authority uh, to do more, to reconsider, to have further conversations. Can I, in direct answer to perhaps her, her question, can I, can I over, overturn the local authority decision? Of, of course, I, I couldn't do that, particularly where there's no planning. Um, this goes back to the petitioner's request, actually, in some regards to, to a moratorium. That's partly why a moratorium wouldn't be effective. Many of these um, uh, shared space schemes don't require, for example, a change in planning uh, at all. Mm -hmm. There are already spaces uh, that are, are, are uh, for designed for, for that use. Um, so in terms of local authority, of course, we're, we're always happy to have conversations with, with in yeah. this case, in Eastern Bartonshire. 
um, and others. Uh, on this, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, of course, can also be asked to look into this matter if it's mm -hmm. felt that uh, mm -hmm. the public sector duties are not being adhered to. Can I, can I ask if, a, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can I ask if you would write to the local authority uh, in this instance to, to express your concern? Uh, I'll certainly have a conversation with the local authority and I'll okay. report back to the member on that. I've got no uh, uh, concerns in, in, in doing that uh, at all. Ultimately, I would have to leave the decision for the local authority to, to, to make. Um, but I'm more than happy to have the conversation uh, with them. I suspect, having read their submission to the committee, that they would characterise what they've done slightly different to, the, to, to your characterisation. Yes. That uh, is, again, for not for me to be the arbiter of that. But it seems to me that in any shared space, if there are these genuine concerns, the utmost should be done to try to resolve and try to give reassurances, particularly to our most vulnerable road users, which in yes. this case, of course, yes. are those with a disability or, or indeed a visual impairment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Whittle. Um, looking at examples of shared space schemes that have been introduced in Scotland, we understand that some of these schemes have had controlled crossings added retrospectively. Um, Deafblind Scotland's submission on the petition noted the difficulties experienced by people who can neither see nor hear traffic. Uh, they highlighted that deafblind people rely on controlled crossings mainly with the road rotating cones and tactile markings to alert them to uh, cross the road safely. Without such crossings and other elements of street design, the submission argues that the shared space may take away the independence of people leaving them feeling unsafe and lacking confidence, also excluding them from their town centre. Um, Deafblind Scotland question why aesthetic appeal should be given priority over safety. C can I ask you to respond to that point and set out how the Scottish Government supports the development of design that protects the safety of all users? I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, agree with the premise that aesthetics uh, uh, takes uh, priority uh, over the needs of particularly vulnerable uh, road users. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that for, this, for the point of view, from my point of view, uh, and what the guidance says, it doesn't suggest that uh, having a controlled crossing would suddenly uh, uh, deem a space no longer a, uh, a shared space. I know that uh, that is the opinion uh, of some. I think if uh, level crossings uh, are added in so that they make uh, the shared space more uh, appealing and, of course, actually are necessary, I should say, uh, for vulnerable road users, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be as part of the development and design stage uh, of a shared space. Uh, that is why we encourage and the guidance encourages collaboration right from the beginning, right from the inception or conception stage of an idea. Uh, local access panels and disability groups, uh, the one that the member mentions, they should be involved in those discussions. Uh, and if level crossings are necessary in a shared space, um, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be there from the very beginning as opposed to retrospectively being added in. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you, um, Kamina. Yes, uh, Minister, the, the, another element of the shared space schemes is the use of level services. And we appreciate there is a balance to be struck uh, here and that level services may be beneficial to some but not others. Um, however, a particular concern was raised about what level services mean for people who use guide dogs or long sticks. Uh, and long canes to navigate streets, uh, with curbs being an essential part of that navigation, uh, so they can't obviously feel when they get to the edge of the pavement. Um, this is recognised in designing streets under the heading of inclusive design, uh, which sets out the role of quality audit uh, and a place for the collaborative design. Is there an area in, in relation to designing streets that you would consider strengthening or providing um, supplementary guidance on in respect to what I've just said? Yes, uh, it would be, the, would be the short answer. I think from everything that members have said uh, and the concerns that Mr Taylor has, has raised in, in his petition, there's definitely merit uh, in us looking to, to examine the concerns that have been raised and my suggestion of doing that alongside Edinburgh Napier's uh, Transport Research Institute uh, would probably be the best forum by which to do that and I would invite, of course, uh, members uh, around the table here and indeed uh, the petitioner himself to be involved in, in that discussion. Uh, it should be said that... Um, uh, in some shared spaces where there's uh, no curb, other measures have been put in place, so tactile paving, uh, which I've mentioned, which members will, will understand. And even a slight delineation in the road, small one, 25 millimetres, for example, not a curb, and, uh, but so it has been, uh, in some instances, shown to, to, to provide the necessary 
um, um, delineation so that uh, somebody using a stick or even uh, a guide dog would be able to notice a difference in the level surface is, 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 uh, uh, as subtle as it, as it may be. But um, certainly the member's suggestion of exploring that uh, further, I think, is, is a sensible one and uh, we, should, we should do that. So I think we certainly will. Uh, and as I've mentioned uh, on the back of uh, uh, Lord Holmes' um, uh, report into, into shared space, uh, the DFT are now doing some work and uh, the report is due to uh, Lord Ahmed of, of Wimbledon, who's the, uh, the, the minister leading uh, the, the response, uh, that report is due at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very, very interested to see the outcomes and the outputs of that. And I think that can inform our own discussions uh, here in Scotland as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask what the, the time scale for the forum being arranged might be? That would help out? Well, yes, uh, uh -huh. I was thinking that it would make sense to wait until the DFT report, uh, which is due at the end of the year, comes forward and that can perhaps also help to inform us, but I think we should look to do it. Uh, I'll speak to, of course, Edinburgh Napier, and I'll put them into, into uh, put them into a, a, a time scale that they're not able to, uh, to, to be able to meet. But uh, I think we should look to do this early next year. Um, but again, we can explore the time scales if that can be done earlier. Uh, and the committee think there's merit in doing that earlier, then then I'll explore that. But I think early next year is when we should uh, explore to to do this. Okay, thanks, Angus Macdonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, one of the concerns raised by Sandy Taylor uh, ha ha has related to um, the issue of sources of funding available to, to assist local authorities in, in meeting the costs of redevelopment of areas. Um, specifically, he's mentioned funding allocated by Transport Scotland to Sustrans. Uh, now, his view is that uh, the scoring or the, the weighting given to applications for Sustrans funding have contributed to greater weight and focus being placed on meeting the needs of cyclists over other users. I'd be interested to hear your view on Sandy's view. Yes, again, I spoke to Mr Taylor just about that before we, we, we walked in and tried to, to give him some reassurance if I can. In the, in the first six months of this job, I've had uh, many a conversation with Sustrans, uh, Scotland, as you'd imagine, and um, their commitment to uh, inclusivity and accessibility is, uh, is beyond question. Uh, you know, an organisation there that uh, everything that they do, uh, they always take into account uh, how that can help uh, and how they can help and assist uh, and include the most vulnerable uh, as part of their ethos uh, for them, uh, primarily cycling, but also, of course, working with Path for All and other organisations so that walkways and pathway, uh, footways, uh, footpaths uh, are part of that conversation uh, as well. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, criteria for, for, for shared space uh, schemes, uh, Sustrans, uh, they, they, of course, any, any bid that they support uh, must comply with the national policy, the design guidance uh, that I've explained already, the Scots guidance and our own guidance, of course, from a national perspective. Um, and, 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 and that is part of what they do. I don't think there's a conflict uh, for them. I don't, you know, because a scheme um, receives assistance and funding from Sustrans, uh, that doesn't mean at all or give them any carte blanche to just ignore the needs uh, of, of, of uh, pedestrians uh, at all in favour of, for example, cyclists. Uh, in fact, Sustrans uh, are aware of the road user hierarchy, which I've already mentioned, which puts pedestrians first and the private uh, motor vehicle uh, last. Um, so, uh, again, I have read Sustrans' submission um, to this uh, committee, and I thought it was very powerful. Um, and so I have no uh, questions over there, uh, any potential conflict uh, at all in, in terms of uh, this scheme. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, another issue that's been raised with us um, by Sarah Gayton, a campaigner who's looked at shared space uh, schemes across the UK, is the collection of data on accidents in shared space schemes. Have any concerns been raised with the Scottish Government about the collection of data on accidents in these schemes? And just to uh, go back to what you were saying earlier about um, these schemes primarily or pr preferably being uh, initiated in residential areas, this particular one that the petitioner is um, uh, referring to is, is probably one of the busiest junctions in the west of Scotland with cars and lorries going through it at alarming speed. Uh, a bus is, it's a, bu a big bus route, so it's, it's, it's far from a, a residential area. Yes, I, mean, I would just reiterate that the Designing Streets guidance is primarily focused towards uh, lightly trafficked and uh, residential area spaces. That's not to say 
though it excludes or explicitly excludes uh, town centres or even busier uh, areas, but clearly with those busy area, busier areas, the needs of vulnerable road users and uh, must be taken into must be taken into account, and those. Um, you know, those uh, reassurances must be given to those individuals uh, as, as best as possible. I can tell from the submissions that you've had and the written submissions you've had to, to your committee that disability groups and local access panels are not convinced uh, by the uh, plans the local authorities put forward. And uh, as I said, I've given a commitment to the member to speak to the local authority about uh, that, because uh, clearly it's not just the voice of one petitioner. Uh, at all, that, uh, suggesting that these concerns exist. Uh, in terms of our uh, first question, uh, the pedestrians, uh, pedestrian injuries and pedestrian casualties, uh, the, the, thankfully the trajectory is, is a downward trajectory. Uh, of course, one uh, casualty, indeed uh, one fatality in our roads and our uh, shared spaces is, is, is one uh, too many. Uh, in terms of our specific question, uh, we don't have statistics for casualties specific to shared spaces. It's something I will speak to colleagues at Transport Scotland to explore whether that's possible, feasible, whether we're able to break it down by that. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced it, it will be all that uh, easy to do, but uh, there's no harm in exploring uh, that issue. Thank you. Okay, Brian Mitchell. Just, just to follow on from that. I mean, if it was feasible to collect reliable accident data um, uh, to to understand whether well, the shared space scheme are creating a higher risk, and if it's found to be a, a, a higher risk in general, uh, or accidents associated with certain features of the shared space, where would you see the role for Scottish government guidance in reflecting this risk? Well, if there was a, a, a risk, and uh, again, that's. Uh not uh, my understanding. I've not had uh, correspondence uh, to suggest that would be the case. But if, hypothetically speaking, we collected the data and the data showed us, uh, then clearly uh, national guidance would have to reflect uh, the reasons for that. And if it was vulnerable road users, for example, uh, that were the victims of these uh, casualties, then we would have to, in our national guidance, uh, ensure that we put in additional measures uh, that gave them the reassurances they needed, whether that was for example, stipulating level crossings or any other such measure that would help to reduce casualties, we would look to do that. But uh, this is a uh, uber hypothetical scenario and we don't have the data yet. We don't know if we're able to collect the data yet. And we don't know if we do collect that data and are able to collect that data, what it will reflect. But I have to say thus far, um, I have not had uh, correspondence to suggest that uh, those shared space schemes that exist currently uh, are uh, are more dangerous, or indeed uh, uh, even less dangerous than uh, than other spaces on the road. Okay. Can I maybe just flag up some another question that's been raised by Sustrans? Because in its response to the committee in the petition, it says, "We contend that the introduction of controlled crossings into an infrastructure project in the urban realm causes that project to cease to be considered a shared space scheme." and become a standard orthodox treatment for the urban environment, such as can be seen in many high streets in Scotland. Do you think that argument, we, we, you've said in you know, designing streets that there's, you can have a preference one way or another, and we've already accepted that maybe you might want to strengthen that, is their contention that actually to do that stops it being a shared space? Does that match with your understanding of shared space as set out in policies and statements such uh, as designing yeah. streets? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I would say not necessarily that is uh, their, their, their opinion. Um, designing streets doesn't go into definition of what a, a shared space uh, necessarily constitutes and, and what exactly it is. Um, if we give general guidance and it's then for uh, local authorities and others to interpret that. But uh, no, I wouldn't say necessarily if there's a level crossing put in a shared space to make it uh, uh, more accessible for vulnerable road users, that should take away from it being quote-unquote a, a, a shared space. So no, I, I don't share uh, that exact uh, interpretation, Convener. It, it's not a level crossing, but a controlled crossing? Yes, or a controlled crossing, or, or indeed a level crossing. Uh, you know, for me, that uh, you know, there can be other, other characteristics of a shared space that still make it a shared uh, space. I mean, sure. what, we, what we're looking at in a shared space is the reduction of vehicle dominance. And if that can be produced uh, and, and that can be the final output, uh, then I don't see why uh, that uh, shouldn't be uh, a shared space. But don't you think there's an issue that you're funding Sustrans and they have a directly opposed view to you have about the 
what happens if you put controlled crossings into a shared space. They, would, they seem to be arguing that stops becoming a shared space. You're saying it doesn't, while at the same time our petitioner and others are concerned that because shared spaces presumably support the Sustrans view that you can't have controlled crossings, um, they're ending up in a position where their concerns no, I mean, I are think not it's, being addressed. Uh, uh, this comes down to a matter of interpretation, uh, and that's why you know, the recommendation from petitioners, from members around table to see if we can strengthen the guidance, I think it's a good one. And Sustrans should be part uh, of that conversation. Mm. Local authorities should be part of that conversation. Um, but that is not uh, what I believe, for example, a local authority. They should be not taking guidance. Uh, they should be using our national guidance that we have produced from Designing Streets, but also Scots have produced. That should be their over overarching guidance. And that suggests in that guidance that any approach to a shared space should be inclusive of disability groups. And if that includes a level crossing, includes a control crossing, then I would have uh, no uh, concern. It would give me no concern from a governmental point of view uh, on, 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 on uh, you know, calling it a shared space. But I think that's uh, a matter of interpretation, but one that I'm happy for the guidance to, to be strengthened on. But surely, with respect, Sustrans, it shouldn't be a matter of interpretation. If you're funding them to deliver a national policy, you would expect them to have a position understood that. You're clearly saying, and I recognise that, that there is a place for controlled crossings. Sustrans are saying, if there's a controlled crossing, that means it's no longer a shared space. And well, that seems to me, I mean, would it be fair then to say that it'd be worthwhile you exploring with Sustrans what their understanding of impact of putting in controlled crossings on your commitment to shared spaces, which are also safe for people with disabilities? Yes, I'm, I'm more than happy. And as what I was about to say was that I'm more than happy to have that conversation uh, with Sustrans, although Sustrans receive our funding, as many organisations, uh, many bodies do. Uh, you know, uh, my the national guidance that we produce, the guidance that's produced by Scots, uh, should be what local authorities look towards when designing uh, their shared spaces, not what third party organisations necessarily, uh, or their guidance or their interpretation. It should be the guidance of designing streets. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and the guidance that's been produced by Scots uh, that I think uh, they should be looking towards. But of course, I'm more than happy to take uh, your suggestion, convener, and have a conversation with Sustrans about their understanding of a shared space. Okay, are there any further questions? Brian yeah, Quittle? Yes, can I, just, just a point of clarification, really, on, on a point made earlier. I just wanted to, for my own uh, peace of mind here, if, if local authorities are deemed to contravene uh, an inclusive policy, uh, what would the Scottish Government's position be and potential action? As, as guidance as opposed to, to what's in the, in the statute. Uh, and so when it comes to that guidance, uh, there are, uh, as I've mentioned in my earlier remarks, uh, you know, organisations, individuals can seek redress through the Equality and Human Rights Commission because every local authority must uh, live up to its public sector duty. So if they're seen to be in contradiction to that. And then, of course, the, 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 the maybe a last resort of, of going down the courts, but it shouldn't have to, um, as the conveners already suggested, uh, get down there. But I would hope that there would be a resolution before it got to that stage. And um, petitions, of course, uh, allow some of those issues to be aired. But, uh, of course, as a government minister, I wouldn't look to, you know, uh, you know uh, for example, impose my view on every high street and every local authority in Scotland. But I'm more than happy where appropriate, as has been suggested today, have a conversation with a local authority to express concerns that have been expressed um, to me and see if we can come to some sort of resolution on that. But the guidance is very, very clear, both from a national level and from a local level, that including disability groups and access panels from the very, very beginning uh, is, is, is the best approach to take. Uh, so, so, sorry. Uh, it, just, it just seems to me that, uh, quite an arduous process uh, this petitioner has had to go through to, to get uh, their, their views aired. And I know we can't speak on specifics here, and you've already committed to speaking to the local authority. And it just, as I said, it seems to me a very arduous process to get to a point where you know, views are heard. And uh, my concern would be that many people in the same position would probably give up before they got to here. Mm. Well, you know, that's a fair point, uh, I think, to make. And again, if I can suggest for the seminar that's, um, that I've committed to, to doing to explore some of these issues, perhaps that can be one of the, the issues that we discuss about, uh, you know, if there are real issues of concern, not just one lone voice, uh, but in you know, this case, it seems to me there's a number of voices that share those concerns. 
that the process um, uh, is made easier to, to to appeal. But you know, essentially, it's up to whether or not local authorities choose to listen to those voices or not. Uh, and again, I'm not making a, a judgment on a specific or individual case. But if there are 10 or 20 you know, disability organisations and local access panels saying the same thing, I think it would be an abdication of responsibility from a local authority to just ignore those um, or, or sweep those to the side. Again, I'm not making that uh, on the specific uh, case of this petition, but I'm just saying generally that wouldn't be a, a particularly uh, wise approach. You think a local authority should listen to, to those voices, um, but if the guidance needs strengthened to, to, to try to, to encourage that in a, in a, in a stronger way, then um, we can explore that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we obviously now have to think about how we want to take this petition forward. Can I maybe say from my point of view, I think the Minister says that the guidance is very clear, but it, clear is, it, it would seem that as far as at local level, it is not very clear and there is some, certainly some dispute with Sustrans and others about what the guidance actually means. I think, certainly I think perhaps it might suggest that we would seek, following this session, that the Scottish Government comes back really so looks at can indicates how they would be looking to uh, strengthen the guidance or to respond to the, the concerns that have been raised. Um, I would also be interested if the, the Scottish Government would be willing in general terms to raise this question with local authorities because I recognise we can't in the petition deal with the specific petition but with the issues that more broadly are highlighted. I think we would be asking um, the Scottish Government to do that and I think we would welcome the forum um, and maybe at some point we can get correspondence back from the Scottish Government about when that would be and how you envisage that, what the aims of it would be and what would you see coming out the other end of it. I don't know if other members have other suggestions of what we might do. Rona? I, I agree with what, everything that you said there um, and I, I would also like to um, take the petition uh, to the Equalities Committee because I believe this Council is not complying with the Equality Act 2010. And I think it would be uh, good if they could have a look at it to, to give an opinion on that. I'm not quite sure how we would do that. I mean, I think, first of all, I think we need to take the issue as opposed to the local authority, mm -hmm. given we're in terms of dealing with because the local authority has not been able to um, argue its position. So the question is, you know, is the guidance strong enough to protect the rights of people with disabilities and our shared spaces as an idea actually problematic for people in terms of equalities and perhaps when we get information back from the Scottish Government we then might want to refer the petition at that point. I think if we refer it we then we let go of it. it. So yeah, that no, might be something no, we want to agreed, look at further. Agreed, yeah. But I think we've also heard from the Minister today specific to the petitioner that there are avenues open to, to him in terms of taking it forward as well. Are there any other suggestions? No? Okay. I think that has been um, a very useful discussion. Can I thank the Minister very much um, and his officials for their attendance this morning and for the commitments they have made in terms of addressing the petition and can I suspend the meeting to allow for a change over of witnesses?
bring the meeting back to order. Um, and can we now turn to agenda item number three, which is a consideration of new petitions. Turning now to new petitions, we have two to consider this morning. First of all, petition 1612 on the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme changed to the same roof rule. This is a new petition lodged by Graeme McKinley. Members have a briefing paper along with a copy of the petition. I'm pleased to welcome Mr McKinley to this morning's meeting to speak to his petition and to answer any questions members have to help our consideration of his petition. Mr McKinley, um, you now have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement after which we'll move to questions from members. Thank you. Thank you for seeing me. Here today, further to my petition in respect of compensation for victims of childhood sexual abuse who have thus far been denied compensation under what is called the same roof rule. There are many factors and experiences in our childhood which influence our future path. I've served on the children's panel. I've witnessed some pretty awful cases of neglect and cruelty. I've been a foster carer and witnessed the trauma that children have had to live with. I have family members who are alcoholics. With an alcoholic, one can relatively spot when they have been drinking, times of sobriety, times of reckless abandon. With an alcoholic, there's usually some trigger, a loss of a loved one, family breakdown. The pain is obvious. The path they walk is usually fairly obvious to see. Sure, we can all have good days and bad days, but so many victims of childhood sexual abuse suffer in silence. They have been abused, betrayed, let down, often threatened to keep quiet and to tell no one or else. So they experience the mental anguish suffered by, for example, alcoholics or those with mental health issues. But to an outsider or even with close family members, the cause of their anguish, their pain, is often so hard to establish. It is a time of silence for such victims. They dare not speak for fear of retribution. But worse than that is the fear that somehow they have only themselves to blame. The abuse leaves victims feeling dirty, unwanted, worthless. What will happen to me if I tell my mother? What will happen to my siblings? And where does that leave me? Surely I am damaged goods. I have been mentally and physically abused. Who would ever want to love me for me with all the baggage that has been forced upon me? If I tell someone, will they believe me? Will they help me? What help is out there? And who can I turn to and who can I trust? So many victims of childhood sexual abuse, for many reasons, remain silent. It affects their whole lives. It affects their mental health. It can affect their physical health. Studies have shown the victims often have medical problems and may even have a shorter lifespan because of the abuse. I know this. Me, I had a great childhood. I wasn't aware of childhood sexual abuse until my wife, until I met Linda, who I was to marry and be with for some 25 years. Linda had been abused by her father from a very early age, up until she ran away from home on the day of her 16th birthday. It was a year or so after we'd been together that Linda felt able to tell me about the abuse. Linda got help and by and large it worked, but it did not stop the memories, the feelings of fear, the feeling of being used, of being worthless. It did not stop the nightmares or the sense of shame, and yes, somehow, the feeling of being in some way to blame. Linda died at the age of 58 some three years ago. Poor health and terrible memories were with her every single day. What I am seeking is not just financial compensation for such victims, but perhaps more importantly, recognition of the wrongs inflicted upon them. To explain being abused as a child is quite honestly beyond any words, let down by family, let down by everyone, including themselves. Let down by a system that discriminates against victims because of some arbitrary dates, chosen as a money-saving scheme. Linda, along with so many others, was let down by the powers that be. I'm here in Parliament and I would ask, as requested in my petition, that you give help to those presently excluded under this so-called same roof rule. It is not fair, it is wrong, it must be changed. I, with many others, have tried over many years to have this rule abolished. This is the very place and the very building containing very people who have the power to bring about such a change. The law applies equally to all. No one is above the law. All persons shall be equal before the law. 
apart from, it seems, those victims so far denied compensation. It's not just about money, it's about recognition for what happened to all those who still suffer many years after they were abused. I would most respectfully ask for your help. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that, and I appreciate um, the thoughtfulness and, and the fact that it's a personal thing to you, that how um, difficult that must be for you, and I very much appreciate your very powerful statement today, if I might say so. Can I start off just some of the technicalities around this and asking why do you think we have... You suggest a cut-off date. There's a cut-off date simply because of financial consideration. But why do you think specifically, or maybe help us understand why the 1st of October 1979, do you know what the thinking behind that was? I, I have tried um, relentlessly, as has other people who have been involved with this, um, solicitors, MSPs, MPs. Nobody can give me a reason for those arbitrary dates. Okay. No reason at all. Okay, that's obviously something we may... The first thing that we can um, pursue, can I ask Rona Mackay for a question? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, your petition suggests two options for making a change to enable people to claim compensation for injuries they've suffered. And I, I think we're, we're obviously going to try and, and tease out a bit of detail about, about each of those options as, as we go on. Um, but to start with, can I ask whether you'd have a particular preference for one option over the other? Not really. I, I think recognition is the primary objective, I think, in terms of um, whether they get a lump sum from whatever source or whether they get their, what they're entitled to through the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme, in many ways is irrelevant. Um, I, I think recognition and some acknowledgement that they've not been excluded from what other people can get by, by law and by rights. So you're, you're flagging up both options, but you've no real preference. For none none whatsoever. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, sorry, having said that, I'm aware that um, it comes out the, the public purse, as it were. Um, so uh, that's at the back of my mind as well. All right, thank you. Okay, Maurice Corey. Thank you, Vina. Um, Mr McKinley, um, very interesting to hear what you had to say in your opening statement. Uh, you offer two suggestions in your petition. Uh, the first is to seek a change in the rules applicable to Scotland. And can I ask you um, how you envisage that this might happen? And for example, our briefing paper refers to the eligibility criteria set out in paragraphs 19 and 20 of the current scheme, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme 2012. Is it your view that the wording could be adjusted to say that this does not apply to Scotland? It, I understand that that can happen. Um, similarly, because Scotland, um, if, if there is money paid through the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme for victims in Scotland, then that comes out the Scottish purse. Um, so yes, if it can be added that this is not applicable in Scotland, that might be a simple, easier way to do it. All right, thank you. Um, Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, um, convener. Uh, as we know, the eligibility res restrictions under the same roof rule are less restrictive after the 1st of October uh, 1979 date, um, which only applies to, to adults after that date. Um, however, unfortunately, that didn't apply uh, retrospectively back to 1964. Um, now, we know that the, the power to establish a, a separate scheme for Scotland lies within the devolved competencies of the Scottish Parliament, uh, and clearly we need to find out uh, what the, the Scottish Government's position is on that uh, at the moment. However, your um, alternative suggestion uh, that the Scottish Parliament create a separate mechanism to ensure that individuals who are currently unable to claim under the present scheme are fully compensated for their injuries. Have you considered how such a mechanism like that might work, uh, including who would administer it and whether it would mean complete withdrawal from the existing scheme? don't think it needs complete withdrawal from the existing scheme. I think the Criminal Injuries Compensation Scheme, I have spoken to them, I think they would be able to provide a list of people who have been refused under the same roof rule. And I think it would then be possibly open to re-examine those particular cases um, and to make a decision. Exactly who would do that, I'm not certain. Um, but I think if criminal injuries compensation, sorry, if the criminal injuries compensation scheme were able to provide a list and able to provide reasons why it was refused, um, and if it was simply only under the same roof rule, then I think that would be reasonably simple to remedy. Okay, 
And t taking the, the, the same roof rule out of the issue, do you, do you think the model uh, of the existing scheme works? I think by and large it does. But I think there is inequalities in it. Um, I, I think there are different rates depending on the type of injury, the nature of injury and the long lasting effects of it. <laughs> I think generally the criminal injuries compensation scheme could possibly do with an overhaul. I'm not sure it's entirely as up to date or as fair to everyone, not just to victims of sexual abuse. I think it possibly needs re-examined. Okay, thank you. Okay, Brian Whittle. Thank you, convener. Um, the briefing on the petition that we have notes uh, that the rule was introduced to stop offenders benefiting from compensation paid to victims who lived with them. And successive governments have decided not to change the same roof rule for costs and, and other reasons. Perhaps you could explain to us your view on the issue of preventing offenders benefiting and the reasons for not changing the rule that have been given by government? I think the reason for not changing the rule given by government is money saving, uh, to put it bluntly. I think in terms of the, the family, or if a father, for example, had abused a daughter and the daughter received money, it is understandable that that family should not benefit, the, the, the perpetrator should not benefit by getting hands on money. But I think that's maybe slightly misleading. I don't think any body paying out money is going to do it in such a way that either the person is too young or that the person is going to have access to that money where somebody else could also have access to that money. So I, I don't think that's desperately a valid reason for, for the rule. Well, thank you. Could, could you also say a little bit about your view that changes to the rule were not applied retrospectively because it was consistent with general government approach that rule changes apply to future claimants? I think I'm still uncertain as to why these dates exist, these specific dates exist. Um, I'm not sure why, why it was not made retrospectively. I, I've just at a loss as to why that happened. I can't explain it. Um, I'm angry that it, it happened. Um, had my wife at the time been successful, this would never have taken place. But I know, having spoken to many other um, victims and to support groups and solicitors and the like, um, that there are still a number of people out there who have been denied this. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay, well, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Angus MacDonald. Um, uh, Mr McKinley, this may be a bit of an, an unfair question, so I'll understand if, 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 you know, if you're not able to answer, but uh, are you aware of any financial projections of, of how much would be required to meet any future claims if um, were in respect of, of abuse prior to 1979, if, if that were allowed retrospectively. Right. The criminal injuries compensation scheme do publish in their annual report the number of cases that have been refused. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, given the age of victims nowadays, um, I don't think that there's going to be that many. I don't think it's going to be millions and millions of pounds. And I think the alternative way of ensuring that you know, whatever budget is set that it's adhered to is that there's a limit put on it, which might be considerably less than they would get under the criminal injuries compensation scheme. But if Scotland said, OK, we will pay retrospectively on these cases, but we will limit it to, for example, £5,000 or whatever the figure, um, then that would be one way of ensuring that the budget is not blown out of all proportion. Yeah. OK, thank you. Can I just, you know, two issues really. First of all, just to kind of clarify the, the sense of injustice that if someone were abused by their father in their own home and they were living as a family together, they wouldn't qualify for um, compensation. However, if the father were estranged and were living somewhere else, they would. Um, I had this conversation um, earlier today just deciding where the, where the line is drawn, if you like. I think the sense of injustice um, and I think each case obviously is looked at on its merits, but I think the sense of injustice is where, for example, a person is abused on one occasion by a TV celebrity and receives many, many thousands of pounds, and yet someone who has been abused from the age of two to the age of 16 receives nothing when they're abused by their own family member. I think that's where the injustice mm -hmm. is more apparent and, and more personal to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I think that's an issue that certainly um, I've been aware of more generally in relation to issues that survivors feel quite strongly about, that the attention paid 
so, sadly, sometimes in celebrity in order to focus on some of the things that are, are happening. The other issue is, I'm interested in what you say about the flaws of the, the criminal compensation scheme um, specifically. I'm aware of a, a, a case many years ago now I dealt with where someone had dealt, had suffered terrible trauma, there'd been a murder in his family, but his compensation was reduced because he had a, a conviction for being, I think, you know, a breach of the peace or something, yes. which actually you could probably relate to the trauma of what had happened to him and his family. And therefore, I mean, do you have a view on the way in which compensation is re reduced more generally with this kind of tariff? Is this something you would like to be looked at too? I, I think there is possibly a good reason for having it. Um, I, I, I think one of the sort of background reasons possibly for that existing is that if if somebody is going to benefit, but they have also committed crimes themselves, which other people have been compensated for, I don't think that's fair. So yes, I think, I think there's a, a need to look at the background of the individual applying and their history as well. Mm -hmm. Does that explain that? Yeah, absolutely. I wonder whether, um, finally, the kind of issues that you raised around the impact that this other issues as well on somebody who's a survivor or a victim of, of that kind of abuse. Um, you'll, you know there's a national inquiry into um, historic cases of abuse against people who are in care. It, it, the issues that you highlight, do you think there's a way of them being fed, and not so much into the inquiry because it's something that happened in the home, but is this something that you think should be sort of informed or, or presented to government in terms of the broader strategy for dealing with people who are victims of abuse? I think so. I, I have spoken to, um, it wasn't um, Boyle QC, I think at the time, um, I'd had correspondence with them. I, I think the inquiry is superb, but it seems mostly obviously to relate to people who've either been in foster care or been in an institution. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would like to see expanded to look into and take account of those victims who have been abused out with those particular areas that are being looked at. Mm -hmm. So that childhood sense of not being believed and being frightened is then compounded by a system which says your abuse is, doesn't fit into the hierarchy of abuse that we're looking at. Exactly. Okay, are there any further questions? Just a comment. Really, Brian? I think this, the, the, the puzzlement to me really is that uh, this idea of you know, not getting compensation because the victim lives within the environment in which they were abused. It seems highly unlikely to me that uh, if such abuse is highlighted that they would be remaining within. I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, my wife was abused, um, lived within the same family roof because there was nowhere else for her to go because she was scared to speak. She did not speak about it until she was in her late 30s, early 40s. Mm. And that's where the problem arises. Certainly if a, a child of 14 was abused and nowadays went to social work, the police, everybody else became involved, the child would either be removed from the home or and you know, the, the perpetrator would be removed from the home. So nowadays there's a lot more safeguards there, certainly for younger children. Yeah. But what we're really talking about is victims who were not able to speak out at the time of the abuse. Um, there are people in their in age of 80 who are now coming forward to say I was abused and they've lived with it all these years. No, I, no so I think my, 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 point, my point was that um, if, it came to, if it came to to light that there was abuse, abuse happening, the likelihood is they wouldn't be allowed to remain within the, the, Correct. the family. Correct. Well, know. one would certainly like to think so nowadays, yes. Well, yes. Okay. I, I don't know if you've got any further comments you want to make in conclusion before we try and pull us together? No, I hope, hopefully I've been able to answer your questions and explain what we're looking for. Okay, thanks very much for that. I wonder if people have views on how we can take this forward. Well, the, I think the obvious one is to try and establish why this, this date uh, mm -hmm. has been set. I think that, and, and how, would we, how would we go about, you know, who would we ask to, to, to establish why this specific date has been uh, set? Because obviously, uh, from the petitioners, the comments he has been unable to find out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it would be worthwhile, you know, asking more generally the Scottish government for their comments on the evidence we've heard 
um, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Authority who may be able to address these questions and the broader questions that have been highlighted about their willingness to review their own processes. Anything else? Could I just add sure. that, you know, I, I, I've got notes going back many, many years. I've written to the Ministry of Justice. I've written to every department, including David Cameron, Prime Minister at the time, um, to try and establish why these dates were set. Nobody can tell me. But even if we were able to get them to accept it, it is arbitrary, and maybe there's something to address there. It would be interesting to see what their comments on that are. Because from the information we have, it looks at even where people, this was highlighted, to successive governments, it was not something that they were willing to shift on. So it would be interesting to know what the, th the thinking in that would be. Some of it is about the perpetrator benefiting from a scheme that's meant to protect victims. Anything else we could do? And also seeking the views of Survivors Trust and Victim Scotland, uh, Support Scotland, etc. It's very important because some of the points that Mr McKinney has brought out, I think we need to dig down a bit. Mm -hmm on that, because this is going to be our argument against this date problem, mm -hmm. which is what Brian Whittles brought up. Perhaps with the clerk's help, we could look at what survivors' organisations yeah. would have an interest in, because there are clearly a range from those who have been abused in care, but the sense that in, in, um, the abuse in the family is perhaps not being focused on so much in terms of recompense and you know, recognising the, the yeah. challenges. Anything else we might usefully do at this stage? There's quite a lot there, I think, for us to be able to yeah, investigate. Start, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. In that case, can I um, thank you very much for your attendance, and we will obviously um, make sure that once we have responses, we'll come back to keep you informed of the progress with the petition. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. If we can move on then um, to petition 1620 on the Museum of Fire. This petition is by Colin Fraser on behalf of the Friends of the Museum of Fire. The petition calls on the Scottish Government to meet with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to discuss the future of the Museum of Fire, including its collection and location in the context of the National Strategy for Scotland's Museums and Galleries. Um, members will note we have received copies of correspondence from Gordon Lindhurst, MSP, um, in which he corresponded with the, the Chief Fire Officer and the Chief Fire Officer's response. Members will see from the meeting papers that since the petition was lodged, the building in which the Museum of Fire is located has been sold to the University of Edinburgh. The petitioner has provided a written submission to explain that the Friends of the Museum of Fire have met with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to agree a way forward for the museum. As such, the petitioner has indicated that he would like to withdraw the petition. I wonder, have um, members have any comments or suggestions on how we then deal with this petition? I think as he stated, he'd like to withdraw it. I mean, I think it's in order for us to close. Yeah. I think we can, as suggested by the clerks, close the petition under standing order rule 15.7 on the basis that the petitioner has indicated he would like to withdraw the petition because the museum volunteers have come to an agreement with the SFRS as to the museum's future. Is that agreed? Okay, and we can thank we can thank the petitioner for bringing the petition um, before us. Okay. Um, we're now moving to agenda item four: consideration of continuing petitions. Petition one six one five on a state regulated system for game bird hunting in Scotland. Again, I would want members to note that we have received correspondence from uh, Tim Baines, the director of the Scottish Moorland Group, part of Scottish Land and Estates, and Dr Colin B. Shedden, the director of Scotland um, British Association for Shooting and Conservation, highlighting some of their um, concerns about the evidence we received at our last meeting. We did, of course, consider the petition at our last meeting and discussed the option of referring the petition to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee for consideration as part of its scrutiny of the Wildlife Crime Annual Report. However, before agreeing whether or not to do so, we asked the clerks to see updates on the anticipated timescales for publication and consideration of that report. Updates have been received, as members will have seen from their papers, so we are now asked to consider what action we wish to take. 
and um, I wonder if members have any comments on the best um, way to proceed. Just to clarify, we do refer this, um, and, then, and then it goes out with our, our control, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't know if people have used it. I mean, my view would be that it would probably be useful to refer the petition to the the ECCLR committee to highlight to them the correspondence we've received in response to the evidence that we've heard. And I think we can be reassured that if they're taking evidence, they would take evidence on, on all sides in this. It wouldn't simply be that they would have the evidence that we've heard, but they would take, they would want, I'm sure, to, have it, um, to take evidence from those who have um, corresponded with us. Can we Angus? Um, you referred to the uh, submission that we've just received from um, the Scottish Moorland Group, uh, part of SLE, and the British Association of uh, Shooting and Conservation. <coughs> In the interest of, of balance and impartiality uh, with regard to this committee, um, had there not been a suggestion to refer it to the ECCLR committee, I would have been keen to allow them to come in and give their side of the argument. Yep. Um, and it might, be, it might be helpful to the ECCLR committee if that were done by this committee in advance of uh, it being referred to, um, to ECCLR um, or not. You know, I mean, it's obviously an option for the, 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 that committee if, if they so wish. Um, and if that's the case, then I'd be happy to refer it uh, right away. But uh, given that the committee has taken evidence from, from one side of the argument, um, it would maybe only be fair to take an, uh, the argument from the other side. Do we have views on that? Because I, I think either way, I, I mean, I, it, yeah. I, I think that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. because there are uh, you know, um, regulations in place which can be enacted, and it's really down, as far as reading everything I've read about this, is um, the strength of the authorities actually implementing it and bringing people to book. Yeah, to do Absolutely, yeah, yeah, uh, because yeah, yeah. there are not only just a person who's perpetrated the crime, but also that the landowner does get called to justice on this. Yeah. But I think you're right, because I think if we saw the other side, um, we need to. I mean, at least they allow us to refer, you know, a much, yeah. a much clearer picture. That's not going to cut across the time scales that they would have for dealing mm, with it. No. Okay, I mean, I think, you know, clearly the, the committee takes that view, and I think either way, we see it going to the ECLR committee at one point, but perhaps in terms of fairness and balance, because it's very much the feeling that comes out of the correspondence, there should be an opportunity through the petitions committee to hear that evidence, and then we can refer it on. Is that agreed? More, well, absolutely. Okay. Um, can I thank committee members for that? And that ends the public part of the meeting. Can I now suspend the meeting to allow members of the public to leave and the committee to move into private? <laughs>